Hello from uh, Canberra. Uh, my name is Bryce Wakefield and I am the National Executive Director of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. By 2050, uh, Asia's population is set to grow by 700 million people and 400 million in India alone. At the same time, however, we have uh, rapidly aging societies in China, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. Uh, what do these developments mean for uh, national security in Asia? To discuss this, we have an expert who is focused uh, intently on that, that um, issue right now, Professor Andrew Oros. Hello, Andrew. Hi, Bryce. Andrew is a professor of political science and IR at Washington College. Um, he um, is currently invested in a research project called America's Aging Allies in Asia, National Security and Demographic Change in the Indo-Pacific. His most recent book is this one, Japan's Security Renaissance, uh, which uh, he authored a couple of years back now. Is it Andrew? I mean, I, you signed it for me when you met me a couple of years ago so I guess that's uh, that's uh, what it's uh, when it was published he's also the author of uh, two other books normalizing Japan and global security watch Japan which wow. he authored with Yuki Tatsumi so now you know where your royalties come from Andrew <laughs> um, he is about to embark on his research as a fellow at the Asia Center, which is an excellent institution. And I know this because I used to work there, so I'm completely biased, of course. Um, <laughs> and uh, he is, um, a, uh, as I said, a professor at Washington College and has a PhD from Columbia University. So without further ado, I shall pass things over to Andrew. Andrew, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Bryce. I wish I could be seeing you in person again. My first and only trip to Australia was actually to launch my last book, uh, Japan Security Renaissance. So I hope I'll be able to make another trip in the future to um, launch this book and to see you in person. Um, I wanna thank everyone for zooming in today at a difficult uh, time uh, in everyone's lives, I'm sure. I hope you and your families are doing well. Um, I'm uh, zooming in from uh, the Eastern Shore of Maryland, uh, home of Washington College, and uh, just about an hour outside of Washington, DC. Uh, I'll note that uh, George himself is looking down on us uh, to keep careful watch given his uh, warnings about America getting entangled in alliances abroad. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen now and I wanna start with a few statistics that may surprise you and to kind of set the stage for the rest of my talk. So give me a moment to launch that up here. Um, and let's see here. Um, just one moment, please. Okay, so. Okay, share. There we go. So. Demographic shift in Asia. Let me start with just a few statistics. As you can see on the screen, uh, for those of you looking on, uh, today there are about one and a half million fewer Japanese in the world than there were a decade ago, a population loss that's going to accelerate even more dramatically in the coming years. If you look at this uh, screenshot I have here that shows Japan's population loss as if it were cities in the world, you'll see that my hometown of Los Angeles wiped out in the mid 30s and I'm sorry to say both Melbourne and Sydney uh, lost by uh, 2050. But Japan is not the only place that's experiencing population shrinkage and also aging. Uh, Japan and China combined will lose about 70 million people uh, by 2050. Uh, and South Korea and Taiwan 
uh, as well as China, will join Japan in being a so-called super-aged society where over 20% of the population is over 65. The um, graph you can see on the screen shows China's working age population, not the total population. And you can see the dramatic decline that's expected over the course of, of this century. A second trend I'd like to point out, though, as, as Bryce actually noted at the outset, is that India's uh, population is expected to grow uh, by about 300 million people by 2050. Um, also Indonesia and Asia as a whole by 700 million, which includes Western Asia, so that's beyond the Indo-Pacific. And working age populations also will grow in these places. And finally, as a kind of snapshot of some of the substantial demographic change we'll see in the Indo-Pacific. Um, in China and India today, there is many as one million missing girls annually, which is to say that, um, as you can see in the, in the next data point here, in the 2010 Chinese census found the sex ratio at birth uh, was 118 males for every 100 females, which is way beyond what should be the natural profile. The U.S., uh, you often hear of American exceptionalism. Once again, we see American demographic exceptionalism in this case. The U.S. is the demographic exception in the developed world. I just spoke about India as a developing state. But among the developed world and among the existing great powers, the U.S. is the only country with expected population growth, uh, with an expected increase of about 60 million by 2050. And this is compared to decreases in all of the large states in the developed world. Australia is a middle power, uh, as I would, I would say, and uh, so it's also an exception in, in that it, it's expected to grow from about 25 million today to about 33 million by 2050. But I'll also note in the case of Australia, this growth is from immigration. Australia also does not have a replacement birth rate presently. So what my project is about is how this demographic shift, uh, things like aging populations, this gender balance, shrinking and growing populations will cause states to adjust their national security strategies and in turn will create a new regional security dynamic. So that's what I'd like to talk about today. Uh, but first, let me pause to say thank you uh, to the Australian Institute of International Affairs and to Bryce, a uh, longtime research collaborator, uh, for giving me this platform to discuss my latest research. For the next 20 minutes or so, um, you can see I want to cover these uh, four points, uh, providing some more overall statistics, not just in the region, a little bit about what recent studies that explain, uh, try to explain demographics and national security linkage have said, um, some of the benefits of focusing on the Indo-Pacific region rather than worldwide as much of the existing literature does, and finally to kind of leave you with some takeaways and hopefully a launch pad to question and answers. So with that, um, let me slide my screen down to catch up here and um, let me jump in. Um, so as you can see on this screen, the changes that, that I've talked about, demographic changes are not just in the Indo-Pacific but are a worldwide phenomenon. The world's population continues to grow. It's expected to grow by about 2 billion people between now and 2050. Um, the population of Sub-Saharan Africa is the region that's expected to grow the most. It will it will double by 2050, virtually double. And you can see on this slide other regions, uh, areas of growth. Um, next would be Northern Africa and Western Asia. Um, Oceania, excluding Australia and New Zealand, big percentage growth. Um, Australia and New Zealand also pretty healthy growth, Central and Southern Asia, as you can see. But contrast that to much of the developed world in East Asia, 3% growth. Um, Europe and North America, only 2% growth. Uh, and it's actually this variation that causes me to want to focus especially on the Indo-Pacific. 
Nine countries will make up more than half of the projected population growth between now and 2050. Um, in descending order of this increase, you can see that um, three of them are in the Indo-Pacific region. Number one is India, as Bryce noted at the outset uh, in my introduction. Um, and then a little further down in the top nine are Indonesia and finally the United States. By 2027, India is projected to overtake China as the world's most populous country. But as you saw in my opening statistics, demographic shift is not just about shrinking or growing, but it's also about aging uh, and other things as well. Um, for example, if we look at the aging phenomenon, the median age in India today is almost 30. In the US and China, it's about 40. And in Japan, it's almost 50. As I mentioned, Japan is one of the few so-called super aged societies already in the world. But if you jump ahead 15 years, um, India will still be comparatively much younger. It will rise to 32. Um, the US will still be around 40, China up to 45, Japan up to 55. And if you look further out, you can see in the next quote that um, China's, the percentage of China's population over the age of 65 uh, will double in the next 25 years. Um, in addition, there's other demographic shifts that I believe have national security implications, such as um, the changing ratio of population size among different generations, um, and also in some countries, uh, the growing imbalance of, of males and females. So there is existing scholarship that considers the so-called graying of the great powers. Um, there's two, two sources I've, I've listed here and I provide some references at the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, but the, the basic argument, if we look worldwide at the implications of the graying of the great powers uh, is that the resulting challenges to global security will be quite substantial. Um, the focus of this research, however, has really been about great power competition and things like new security threats that arise from this, for example, immigration uh, to developed states, especially to Europe, um, the effects of youth bulges in Africa and the Mideast, and also research related, excuse me, resource related challenges. Uh, but what about implications for the Indo-Pacific? What I argue is that the literature uh, so far uh, is pretty silent on this issue. And I think that the, ish the challenges that the Indo-Pacific faces is quite different uh, than what we're seeing in the broader literature. Um, the implications are mixed and I wanna talk through some of that now. Uh, someone who really inspired me to think about this topic further is uh, Professor Sheen at Seoul National University who wrote an article that provocatively suggested that perhaps the result of a similar demographic trend happening in this sort of upper circle that you can see in Northeast Asia may be something that he called a demographic peace, that all of the states in this area will see the shared challenges they face and this might bring, bring them together. Uh, unfortunately, I think this is not what we've seen, especially in competition between uh, Japan and China, uh, and also challenges that uh, Korea is facing, especially South Korea is facing, especially with its neighbor um, to the north. Um, and so it made me think about, well, perhaps the issue is that the Northeast Asian region is not really a discrete region anymore. We tend to think more broadly of the Indo-Pacific where we see um, much more variation. So um, with this variation, um, I think that we see new possibilities for how demographic shift is going to affect the security environment. Um, as I noted, in, in Northeast Asia, we see a similar demographic future, although there's a lag. So Japan is already experiencing super aging. When it hits China by around 2030, it will hit hard because their one child policy is the primary reason for uh, the, the aging society and that was implemented very quickly. Um, other US allies in the region, um, beyond Japan, uh, South Korea, Thailand also are facing this challenge, but not Australia, as I noted, or New Zealand, and not the Philippines. Other security partners to Japan and to the US, uh, Taiwan, Singapore, and Vietnam also will face 
uh, population shrinkage and aging. And I think especially important though for understanding the security environment, we need to keep in mind that China, as I've mentioned, but also North Korea and Russia also are facing these demographic challenges. Um, in the broader Indo-Pacific, however, um, you have you can see new potential security partners for countries like Japan and the United States where populations will be growing and also will they be maintaining robust youth populations such as India and Indonesia, for example, that I noted before. And I think it's not coincidental that these states and also growing states like the Philippines and um, Australia are among the states that both Japan and the US are seeking to develop security ties with or deepen ties with. I'm not saying that demographics is the only reason, but I do think it's one reason why um, states that are facing a more difficult demographic profile are looking elsewhere for partners. But there's a lot we don't know from existing research about the effect of demography on national security. Uh, in particular, we don't know how culture and politics will affect how states respond to demographic decline. Uh, so, for example, will states experiencing population shrinkage and aging even remain committed to maintaining a robust military defense posture? Um, or how will these populations think about potential technological alternatives like unmanned systems, um, robotics, drones, artificial intelligence, insecurity? Uh, and will states for example, consider new gender roles, especially increased roles for women in defense uh, as a way to adapt to demographic change. I think these are largely political questions and they're something that as a political scientist, I think I can create uh, or offer some value added to and that's uh, a, a big part of what I'm currently researching and what I plan to continue to research over the next year. Um, one of the main takeaways I'd like you to um, ponder as you think about a question you might ask or an email you might share with me later uh, is that demography is not destiny, right? But it is something I believe that needs to be reckoned with more than it has to date, both by policymakers who are, who are planning a national security doctrine and also by scholars who are considering what are the main variables in uh, the East Asian or the Indo-Pacific security environment. So let's consider some of the steps that have been taken so far uh, in the Indo-Pacific to this very challenge of demographic shift. Um, I'll start with um, Japan's self-defense forces, one of the largest and most capable militaries in the region. Um, they have not met their recruitment targets since 2014. Um, in 2018, which is the latest statistics that I have, um, they set a goal of just under a quarter of a million uh, forces and managed about 227,000, so about an 8% shortfall in the total. But according uh, to research that I've read, um, this shortfall is even larger at the lower ranks. Um, and that's not surprising because if you look at the demographic pool, uh, the prime recruiting uh, target for the self-defense forces are young men from 18 to 26. And that group demographically peaked at 17 million in 1994. That's quite a while ago. I'll note even further that Japan has not enjoyed a replacement birth rate since the early 1970s, uh, two generations ago. But there's a paradox here that links to one of my main takeaways that demography is not destiny. Um, the paradox is of a stronger Japan despite the demographic challenges. I appreciate Bryce holding a physical copy of my last book, Japan's Security Renaissance. Here's a, a virtual uh, cover shot here. Uh, but the central argument of that book that came out in 2017 uh, is that, ironically, in this decade that Japan experienced super aging and a shrinking population, its military forces became more capable than they ever have been before. And I'm certainly not the only person making this argument. My fellow uh, scholars here in Washington, DC, Sheila Smith has a terrific new book out, um, Japan Rearmed. Uh, Jeffrey Horning is writing some terrific articles following up to the minute, including Japan's efforts to um, develop missile strike capability. Uh, so um, 
The question though, and I think what's informing the next step of my research is, can this present level of spending continue given the demographic challenges that Japan faces? And I suspect that it cannot. Um, Japan runs now the largest budget deficit of any developed country by far, and that's only accelerated in this pandemic. But looking beyond Japan, let's consider briefly some demographic factors in South Korea and Taiwan. Um, I was able to go to South Korea to do some initial research last summer. Uh, unfortunately, this summer I had plans to return to South Korea and also um, to, to, to Taiwan uh, to conduct this research that's been put off by the pandemic. Uh, but I've been trying to piece together some of this through Zoom, uh, through email exchange, and one area I'll, I'll draw attention to is conscription. Um, both of these states traditionally have used conscription uh, to meet their defense needs, but paradoxically, at a time when the, the potential pool of young men serving in the military is shrinking, as it has in Japan, both countries have decided to um, minimize conscription. In Taiwan, the decision was to completely phase out conscription, and in South Korea, the decision was to reduce the term that males will serve. Um, and given that conscription is being maintained in Korea, it's a natural question to think, well, what about women? How about women playing a greater role? And that's not something that, that Korean society is, is taking uh, very seriously. So what we see here again is uh, that demography is not destiny here. Some of the other things that I'm considering that we might bring up more in Q&A is um, considering the different manpower needs or personnel needs uh, for different security scenarios that countries are facing. So I don't think that there's a one size fits all model to deal with security threats. So for example, protecting a land border may require more personnel than a maritime border. Um, offensive operations may require more personnel than defensive operations. And also, you know, maintaining sort of peacetime operations versus wartime operations, or increasingly as we're thinking in the Indo-Pacific about so-called gray zone um, uh, contingencies. This also, I think, will affect uh, the extent to which demographics is going to be a hindrance or uh, perhaps a benefit for that state. Um, I'll say a few words about uh, China before um, going to um, the broader Indo-Pacific region. Um, as China further pursues its ambitious military modernization, it is continuing the reduction of the number of personnel overall. This is the long-term trend in China to move from uh, a large number of less equipped and less trained um, members of the armed forces to a smaller number of more highly equipped and highly trained. So in that sense, on the surface, China's shrinking um, demographic pool shouldn't necessarily create a problem like it has um, in Japan. Um, but the declining size of the labor force overall may lead China to struggle to fill uh, its armed forces with the sorts of skilled people that it's looking for. And also, as with Japan, I think in the medium term, China may find it difficult to continue to spend increasing sums on the military, despite its societal demographic challenges from an aging society and a shrinking workforce, such as an inadequate safety net for um, elderly. In the Indo-Pacific region as a whole, um, I guess one of the first points I'd like to stress is that increasingly, as we think about the security environment in the region, we talk about the Indo-Pacific. Um, the US and Japan in particular have led the way in, in renaming their um, regional policies to Indo-Pacific, but it brings in then into my study a much more varied demographic picture. Um, and that variation, I think, will, should cause security planners to consider how different partners in the region may play different roles as a result of changing demographics. The last point I'd like to make uh, before wrapping up relates to new technology. 
uh, such as robotics and other unmanned systems, um, artificial intelligence. Um, certainly, they may offer some offsets for shrinking populations, just as we've seen in the commercial sector. Uh, if you'd like uh, later uh, to uh, look up, I just was sent by one of my research collaborators worldwide. It's nice to have the internet. I'll give a shout out to Verena Blackinger uh, in Germany uh, for sending me a YouTube video of uh, Family Mart, a, a convenience store chain in Japan, testing out a robot uh, to stock shelves. It's a rather foreboding robot but you'll see a picture at the end of the, the slides. Um, but um, what you see in that case of the robot shelf stalker uh, is that it's a telepresence robot. So an actual person is still in a room making the movements through telepresence to restock the shelf. So yes, there is some labor saving because that person isn't going from store to store, but it's still um, a direct you know, connection to a human being. Also, though, uh, in terms of thinking about new technology as a solution to especially shrinking populations and aging society, it's important to point out that new technology itself is altering the nature of the regional security landscape. So the incorporation of new technology is really causing um, uh, security planners to need to rethink um, how they plan for security in the region. I want to sh just read a short quote um, from Christian Bros from uh, an influential foreign affairs article um, last year. He writes, quote, artificial intelligence, autonomous systems, ubiquitous sensors, advanced manufacturing, and quantum science will transform warfare as radically as the technologies of the early 20th century did in the last century. Uh, so yes, the technology through robotics and such may, may facilitate especially countries with shrinking populations. Those countries also somehow have to come up with uh, resources, including personnel, to deal with these new challenges. Um, I was looking just today at Australia's latest uh, defense plan updates. Um, from July of 2020. And you can see clearly in those documents uh, a plan for expanding labor in these areas in, in cyber, uh, for example, in unmanned systems. Um, a recent Economist article quotes a retired Admiral Koda from Japan noting that, excuse the update, um, that he says, quote, drones and robots require operators and skilled engineers, uh, the sort of people the Japan Self-Defense Forces already has trouble attracting. Um, that article goes on to note that, for example, Japan's Cyber Defense Unit, which was set up in 2014, currently has about 220 members, which I think we can all agree is far less than is what Japan needs in such a, uh, a robust area of uh, military competition. So to wrap up, um, I want to leave you with kind of four uh, main sort of takeaway points. Um, number one, that uh, the role of demographic change on national security in the Indo-Pacific is complex, yes, but I don't think we should ignore that just because of the complexity. And, and what I'm seeking to argue is that the impact in the Indo-Pacific is going to be different than demographic change globally. Um, also, we're going to see an impact indirectly through the impact of demographic change on economic growth and varied economic growth in the region. So, for example, a country like Japan, where the population is projected to shrink uh, by tens of millions by mid-century, is going to struggle to keep even its current level of GDP, right, uh, as a result of this. Um, number two, uh, that we see an expansion of the security region in, the, in this area to this idea of an Indo-Pacific, and this creates more variation um, in, in demography as a result of expanding the notion of this region. As I just discussed, the evolution of military technology certainly can play a role in mitigating um, the impact of change for some states, but it also introduces new challenges. And that's an area that I will be spending quite a bit of time considering in my fellowship at the Wilson Center, um, which begins next week. And finally, um, although I'm quite interested in demographic change, I'm glad you all are logged in to hear about uh, some of the impacts of demographic change. 
because I believe it's an important factor. Certainly there are other factors uh, that are playing uh, an even greater role in, um, in the security environment in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and how demographic change affects a certain state is going to be is going to vary based on differences in security threats that states face, based on the availability of technological solutions, and then very importantly, I say as a political scientist, based on whether there's a political and social will to adapt, uh, for example, to new gender roles or to relying on technology in areas where there was concern before, like for example, in artificial intelligence. So so again, demography is not destiny. Um, here is a list of some of the sources that um, I uh, referred to during the course of this talk. Um, I imagine you can see this on um, the archived version of this talk if you'd like to look it up later. Um, so finally, I'd just say thank you for your interest. Um, I look forward to your comments and uh, questions. And um, please uh, look me up in a year or so for some fuller findings. I plan to be writing about different aspects of this uh, from my base at the Wilson Center beginning next week. Uh, my first article on this topic was released last week uh, from the East West Center in Washington, where I used to be a fellow uh, about the case of Japan specifically. And if you'd really like to watch me talk talk more about demographics, you could check out uh, my webinar at the East West Center, which uh, focused just on the case of Japan. So now back to you, Bryce. Thank you. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, I hope you can see me. There I am. Good. Okay. So um, uh, as usual, you should all be uh, Zoom pros by now. So as usual, please type your comments in the Q&A section um, uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to ask a question. Um, a lot of the changes in um, Japanese defense policy over the last, uh, well, um, decade or, or even more, which have very um, expertly uh, uh, categorized or, or described in your book, Japan Security Renaissance, <laughs> it's available from all good bookstores everywhere. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of them, uh, when, when people look at them, a lot of them, a, a lot of people will say, hey, these are reactions. This is in reaction to the rise of China or the rise of North Korea. I guess my question is um, how, to, to what degree are Japanese and other planners around uh, the region looking at um, uh, demographic change as a driver um, for defense reform, perhaps even in absence of um, the external challenges, challenges that, um, that, that these countries might, might face. I mean, if you look at the case of Japan, um, there are initiatives such as the centralization of the defense bureaucracy around the National Security Council, um, initiatives like the reinterpretation of the Constitution for Collective Self-Defense that seem to me to be more about doing the same or more with less. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm wondering to what degree this, uh, this, the, these, these um, variables that you're identifying here have in themselves become a justification for reform of the defense systems in East Asia? Well, in the case of Japan in particular, thank, thank you for the question on that. Um, I, th I think that we're not actually seeing so much impact from the demographic shift so far, but I'll be a bit of a futurologist here. You know, my, my next book hopefully will be out in a few years, and I think we'll be seeing more discussion of this in Japan. Uh, those of you who watch Japan will know that Prime Minister Abe, Japan's longest serving uh, Prime Minister, uh, has just announced that he will be stepping down. And I think part of the discussion uh, that will take place among his successor and one of the areas that will determine how long his successor will be serving. Will he also be a long serving prime minister or will Japan be getting back to a prime minister a year uh, while it tries to deal with these challenges? I think one of the factors will be uh, many voters, many in society will be saying, what about our massive deficit spending, the largest in the industrial world? What about our huge accumulated debt? Can we can we afford to be spending more as a percentage of the budget on defense each year? And I, I predict that the decision will be no, uh, Japan can't afford that. So you mentioned, Bryce, that you know, Japan has been doing more with less. 
Um, I, I, I think I understand where you're going with that because I, I agree that Japan has streamlined a lot of its institutional practices and it's become more efficient in many ways, but it's also spending more on defense than it has before. And it has really invested in capabilities, new destroyers, um, new fighter planes, new radar systems, all of which costs money. And I think it's going to be a challenge for Japan to continue to invest in new hardware moving forward. Okay, we have a comment and a question, I guess, from uh, Corey Wallace, who's uh, a friend of mine. Hi, Corey. Hey, Corey, how's it going? <laughs> um, how's Japan? Right. Um, uh, he notes, along with the age profile and raw population increases, urbanization dynamics are another important factor. It, I guess, urbanization will have a major impact on political stability and economic well-being of a number of emerging countries, uh, thus both an opportunity or a potential destabilizer. So his question is, are developed aging, aging countries doing enough to consider the security of security partners from this point of view, for example, Miltech aspects? Yes, hi, Corey. It's nice to, I'm glad you're, you're zooming in. Um, Corey's, I'm familiar with some of Corey's research back to his doctoral dissertation and um, kudos to him for focusing in part on um, differences in generational attitudes towards security, which is an aspect of demographic change that I'm quite interested in. So as you have more people in the society being older, if older people have different attitudes towards, towards security than younger people, that may change a state's policy, which is something that I'm, I'm quite interested in. So Corey, I'd like to see more an updated uh, um, brief on that. Uh, uh, perhaps offline we can have that exchange. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to another younger scholar, um, Tom Lee of Pomona College, um, in the town of Claremont, California, my hometown. Uh, Tom has a new book coming out from Columbia University Press next year called Japan's Aging Peace, uh, which will be looking at uh, how sustainable this kind of proactive pacifism approach will be um, in, in an aging society. Um, so a number of people are looking at this question. Um, Corey, I'll take up one aspect of what your comment was. It was also about urbanization. And again, I appreciate you raising that because that's another kind of example of, of demographic change, right? That is happening not just in Japan, but in other countries as well. So moving beyond Japan, um, you know, this new book is really about um, the Indo-Pacific broadly, especially um, looking at US allies and partners. Um, we can see uh, an example of this generational cohort change in South Korea, at least that, that's my interpretation based on my field work in, in Korea last year, um, that, um, that the younger generation uh, is showing themselves to be much more um, pro-alliance uh, with the U.S. than um, the middle-aged generation and also more suspicious of China. And also I'll point out in terms of looking at these attitude differences, in the case of South Korea, there's a pretty striking gender difference um, in attitudes uh, towards security, which may be linked to conscription. So if, um, if South Korea is moving away from conscription, we may see that those gender attitudes are, are less um, stark. So, um, Corey, I think I only kind of partially addressed your question, but um, I, I'm glad that you gave me the opportunity to talk about how the demographics really have lots of facets to it. Thanks very much for the question, Corey, and the answer, Andrew. Um, we'll go next to uh, another well-known name, um, Yoichiro Sato, who's already presented here at the Institute. Um, He's asking about non-traditional security threats. So demography altering the balance of power in a traditional military sense was discussed, you discussed it, with some modifications by paying attention to technological adaptability. What about the vulnerability of aging society to non-traditional threats, such as, for example, pandemic and fraud? Are these security issues that you take into account with your research? Hmm. The short answer is not yet. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm sort of 
in the middle of this project at this point. Um, as I said in my presentation, I think that the literature that exists on the impact of demographic change on national security uh, actually does give a lot of um, focus to some non-traditional security issues, in particular um, uh, resource uh, competition, um, climate, and, um, and immigration. Uh, as aspects of um, what many people would call non-traditional security threats. Um, I agree with you that there's, there's just so many dimensions to this. Um, in the case of Japan, where I'm most familiar, uh, you know, the, the majority of Japanese consider these kinds of what, what you're calling non-traditional security threats, the bigger security threats to their daily lives. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see as the society ages that there's gonna be more attention to that. So in that sense, I guess I'll link that to, to um, Corey's interest in generational um, attitude differences. I think we will see in, in Japan and later in China as well, that an older population may be less willing to spend money on new destroyers and new generation fighter planes and more interested in redirecting that money to pandemic safety, for example, or disaster relief. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's, let's go now to Carleen Devine. Uh, who asks, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask a broader question, but she asks, what do you see as the future for Indonesia with the younger age group bias? Um, and I, I wonder if we can take this opportunity for you to flesh out what happens in countries with, um, with younger populations. I know back in the 90s, Samuel Huntington was arguing that uh, countries with young, that there's more potential for, for conflict among populations uh, with uh, younger uh, generations. I don't know how well that theory panned out, but, um, but, but Carleen's question does allow us to ruminate a little bit more, I think, on, um, on, on countries like India, which as you say, has a fairly robust growing population and Indonesia. Are there some trends that you're spotting there? Yes, so thank you, thank you for that question. Um, you may have noted on my opening slide that I actually kind of went through quite quickly. Uh, there was a picture of a Australian hosted um, Australia, Indonesia youth leaders dialogue. Uh, and I wanted to look for an image that um, showed uh, kind of a young, young people um, engaging in their futures in the futures of, of their countries. Uh, so I, I guess the, the picture is going to vary based on um, the economic growth rates of that country, the amount of economic, economic opportunity that the state is able to provide. I don't think that just having a youth population necessarily is going to push in one direction or another. Again, to look at the general literature that I've read, there's a lot of concern in particular about the Middle East and, um, and Sub-Saharan Africa, where you have these very large youth bulges and societies unable to provide economic opportunity for, for younger people that can lead to unrest, it can lead to large scale immigration um, and frustration with government that can lead to you know, political instability. I don't think that that's what we're seeing though in Indonesia uh, or in India, for example, the two states that will grow the largest, I mean, that, that have the largest numerical growth thanks to this demographic shift. So again, this is why I think it's more important to focus on the Indo-Pacific region rather than trying to get insights uh, worldwide. Um, in my references, um, I'll just say as an aside, I also um, want to give a shout out to a piece from 2017 that's looking at NATO countries and how they're dealing with um, aging populations since nearly all NATO countries are aging. Um, so I think we can look at insights from other places, but there are, there are uniquenesses to the Indo-Pacific. Um, I'll just add one more um, thing related to uh, the Indo-Pacific security environment, there's still many security, traditional security threats in East Asia, right? I think if you ask security specialists, you know, what are the main concerns in, in the Indo-Pacific, you know, China's rise, you know, nuclear in North Korea, um, 
great power competition are still seen as major security threats in, in the region, among, among others, as, as Yoichiro Sato noted. Um, so I think that the demographics will play some role in that, but hopefully the societies will be able to channel youth populations. Great, thanks. Um, now, um, I was going to go to Paul Lucas, uh, who had a different question, but I'm going to go to another question from Paul Lucas. Paul is the, uh, the president of our Queensland branch. Um, so just to sort of segue uh, from, those uh, from, from that discussion on traditional threats, um, I'm, Paul is wondering about, he says, the demographic comparisons between North and South Korea. But, I mean, is there any... Um, is there any information that you have? And I was about to joke, are you going to go and do field work in North Korea? But I actually realize you have been to North Korea, haven't you? Um, is, there, um, is there any information that you have that gives us a picture of the demographic situation in North Korea and how that might um, affect security um, in the region? Uh, so I have not been to North Korea, and oh, I have no, no particular interest in visiting it today. Uh, um, but um, what what most of what I've learned about North Korea, I'm, I'm lucky to be based here in Washington. Um, Nick Eberstadt at the American Enterprise Institute is really one of the world known specialists on um, demographic change. I've had a chance to talk to him several times, um, and he also has an interest in North Korea. Um, there is. Um, you know, semi-reliable data about um, the demographic picture in North Korea, but it's not as reliable as we're getting from, from other countries. So we can't say for certain, but it does seem that North Korea is facing a similar demographic picture to the other countries in Northeast Asia, whether it be South Korea uh, or Japan. But I think that there's a critical difference, which is that in a, in a totalitarian state like North Korea, you can simply direct young people to military service. Um, and so the, the challenge of filling the ranks of what's one of the largest militaries um, in, in Asia, I think is, is on a different order than it is um, for other states, even, even for China. Um, so I, I do think that, that South Korea, um, even if it has a similar demographic picture, um, has a real challenge to um, to continue to have a sort of a robust manpower capability to deal with the North Korea threat as it currently exists. Good. Um, okay, well, then that, that gives us a perfect opportunity to segue into Paul's second question, which is about <laughs> the one, China pol uh, one child policy in China. Um, uh, will the dropping or the the past existence of the one china policy have an impact in china's chinese domestic so sensitivity to the loss of young military personnel in expeditionary campaigns paul asks mm -hmm. um and you know will that introduce a previously unseen factor in domestic chinese politics and that mirrors a similar question from han yuan well i i think here thank you for that thank you for that question um here, I think we need to look at the kind of the short term and the much longer term. Um, in, in the short term, what, and even really the medium term, what my research is about is how states are going to respond to the fact that their working age populations will shrink. That's just a fact. It's a demographic fact. So if lots of Chinese families decide to have lots of babies in the next few years, it will not change the fact of a shrinking workforce in the next several decades. And that's the same in Japan and same in Korea. So the security environment that I'm looking at, I'm, I'm really trying to target um, about 2035, so about 15 years from now. Um, that's, in, that's a time frame that we can have a degree of confidence in what the military technology will be that's implemented by states. We have a high degree of confidence of what the demographic profiles of those states will be. Uh, and so in that sense, the end of the one-child policy in China will not affect that at all. Uh, looking much further out, you know, what China's population might look like in 2050, for example, and other states, there, I think, um, there's a kind of a second level to your question, Paul. Um, and, and I think what we've seen so far in China is there hasn't been a, a mini baby boom uh, taking place 
uh, in, in China as a result of the elimination of the one-child policy restrictions. Um, and these, the, the elimination of one-child policy restrictions, in most cases, there are still limits, for example, on a Uyghur um, childbearing um, in, in Western China and, and some other groups, so we should pay attention to that. But the relaxation of the one-child policy took place over more than a decade, and again, we didn't see a dramatic rebound in birth rates. I think just to kind of wrap up on this broader point, not just about China, but also about Japan, about South Korea, is that when you see a non-replacement birth rate continue for a generation, or in, in Japan's case, two generations, that's a very difficult um, societal um, practice to change. Um, Singapore is an example of a country where they've, they've been pretty proactive in trying to kind of alter birth rates over time, uh, encouraging smaller families early on in their independence. And uh, uh, in, in more recent years, uh, when I was last in Singapore, I saw some of the billboards on the streets saying, why not three? No, it's two is really not enough. Why not three kids? Give it a try. And, and having, um, you know, social support, you know, a better apartment, some better childcare allowances for having three children. So I think there are things that can be done. But my research is, again, really looking more at what is the effect of the decisions that have already been made. Great. Um, it looks like we've got Frank Januzzi online, who is the uh, what CEO and president of the Mike and Maureen Mansfield Foundation. Great to see you with us, uh, Frank. Um, uh, and he asked a question, I don't know if it's related to national security so much, but it's a very interesting one nonetheless. Demographic trends seem to be accentuating great power competition in Southeast Asia among Chinese, Japanese, and South Korean enterprises, all striving for market access, talent, and long-term growth. Do you see competition among the aging Asian powers encouraging them to liberalize immigration policies, uh, competing to re recruit talent from Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines, and indeed, could this could could this have a national security impact? I mean, would would there be the possibility of uh, of, of of people serving in the armed forces who are not necessarily citizens? Uh, hi, Frank. Thank you for for zooming in in a similar time zone to me. Um, I had hoped to be traveling with Frank to some of these places in Asia earlier this summer, thanks to the Mansfield Foundation and a grant from the Luz Foundation. I hope we'll be able to do that again, not again, but instead um, next summer. Uh, but to your to your question, Frank, um, I, I see the linkage because. Um, you know, the ability of states to grow economically, uh, to grow robustly, is important to pay for defense. And the ability to find jobs for young people, to keep them engaged, also is an important part of social stability. So these are all sort of indirectly related to national defense. Um, when I had an opportunity to travel in Southeast Asia, actually in the launch of my last book, Japan Security Renaissance, uh, I, I was able to travel to Vietnam, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Bryce. I'm going to have to have you come into all of these Zooms. You know, you've been on multiple windows, so you're going to have to be the guy up in the corner holding up the books. I appreciate that. Uh, but what I found um, in, for example, in Vietnam and in the Philippines uh, was um, a lot of interest in, on the one hand, Japan playing a greater security role in the Southeast Asian region as uh, one player to sort of supplement um, what China is doing and what what um, the U.S. is doing, but also, uh, more to your question, Frank, an interest in um, Japan investing in these places using its resources. And conversely, yes, um, we already see that um, Japan has drawn in um, some level of um, of labor from Vietnam and in particular in, in the Philippines. Um, what I learned when I was in Vietnam last though is that since Vietnam itself is, is facing a shrinking workforce in, in looking forward that I, I heard in sort of individual interviews a degree of resentment that um, Japan is going to try to steal uh, Jap uh, Vietnam's you know, most precious resources, its youth population to push Japan's economic growth rather than staying at home uh, to push um, 
Vietnam's economic growth. I think we're going to see that kind of competition um, in China and in South Korea as well, Frank, uh, as as these younger people become, you know, really um, comparatively rarer. And if you want to have robust or even sustain the same level of, e of economic output with a shrinking population, you need your young people to stay home and to be, you know, utilized at home. Um, I don't have statistics on China, but anecdotally, certainly, especially with the um, rising tensions between the US and China, you have many um, young Chinese who may have been planning to start their careers or to develop their careers in the US um, instead returning to China. And in that sense, there's a demographic aspect to that. But I don't think that the reason for that was demographics. Um, let me also just say, lastly, related to that, you asked about Korea. You know, I grew up in Los Angeles, which has a huge um, Korea town. Many uh, Koreans living um, in Los Angeles um, looking for economic opportunity. Um, I think that uh, there are a number of Koreans who would like to have found that economic opportunity in Korea. And as labor becomes more scarce in Korea, I think there will be more opportunities for younger people to thrive in their home country, which is what some of them would like to do. So um, yes, I think that um, the, the, the competition for labor will become more apparent and it has indirect security implications. All right, fantastic. Um, most of you wouldn't have seen me waving around Andrew's book, so I will just do it now. Um, Japan's security renaissance uh, covers a lot of the, the, the questions that we are talking about here. Um, we are coming to the end of the webinar, so I just want to say uh, what a pleasure it's been to have you on board, Andrew. It's been excellent to have you here with your uh, as always, uh, lucid and, uh, and, and insightful analysis. I appreciate that. And thanks for giving the opportunity to me to talk about this new project. And those of you who might want to follow up with me, you'll find my contact information um, on the, the last slide that will be available um, through the IIA, that's a tongue a -double -I -A. website. Uh, <laughs> a double I, that's much easier, yes, uh, through their website uh, shortly. So thank you for listening and thank you again for hosting me, Bryce. Okay, and um, I want to thank, of course, our extremely competent technical uh, communications assistant, Phoebe Humphreys. Um, and I want to thank uh, you, the audience, for uh, tuning in. And don't go away because uh, coming up, we've got our, um, uh, the, the, we're going to show you the events that are coming up. And if you are interested in East Asia, September is a bumper month. Uh, tonight we have um, MP Dave Sharma talking about Australia's role in the region after COVID or does Australia have what it takes in a post-COVID world. Um, after that, back here in national office, we've got, um, uh, next week, Bilahari Kalsakan, who is a an extremely uh, lucid uh, commentator and an analyst of the region. Um, he was also, of course, um, the former Secretary of Foreign Affairs uh, for Singapore, so don't miss that. Um, if you're interested in Japan, Tobias Harris, who is Shinzo Abe's biographer, is going to join us on the day that Japan formally chooses its new prime minister to talk about Shinzo Abe's legacy, but also um, to discuss the, the future of Japanese politics after Abe. We have Florian Schneider, um, who's at Leiden University talking about Taiwan's digital democracy. And um, much later in the month, we'll have Paul, Paul Midford, who, um, who not only has his own book out, also has um, a multi-authored book uh, coming out or is out now, I think. Um, so don't miss any of that. I, I have a chapter in that book, by the way. I think Andrew might too. Um, but, but for now, we'll uh, leave you here and we'll show you when these events are happening.